Uh, hello and welcome to our artist conversation program. Today we will be speaking with Kelly Kautz and Lauren Wardy, two award-winning painters from Art of the State, about their explorations of interior scenes. And we will be putting their uh, bios and websites in the chat box if you uh, would like to learn more about them. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay, and our first artist today is named Kelly Kautz, and she is a Lancaster resident, and Kelly is a self-taught artist who works across mediums to capture the beauty around her, and to welcome Kelly. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. So happy you're here. The painting that we're looking at right now is called Mary's Office, and this is the one featured in Art of the State this year. And could you tell us how you became interested in art? Yeah, absolutely. My mom is an artist. She was an artist growing up, more as a hobbyist, but I spent a lot of my childhood attending art shows and gallery shows, and I was really immersed in that environment from a young age. So I spent a lot of time really watching her, um, you know, sitting alongside her as she was teaching watercolor lessons. And when I was 13, she quit her job to pursue art and teaching full time. So I still go to her every time I have a painting question. <laughs> it's a great resource to have. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> and um, uh, this is an interesting interior because the, the room is uh, belongs to someone else. Could you tell us a little bit about Mary and what does this painting tell us about her? Yeah. I was sitting in her office. She's the creative director at the agency where I work. And I was sitting in her office um, before a touch base meeting. It was early morning and in the office, we have the most beautiful early morning light that shines through an, the windows at an angle. And I noticed it was shining particularly through the, the plant and hitting the watering can just right. And so as I was sitting there, just looking over this, I thought this would make a great painting. And I quickly took a photo on my uh, iPhone camera. I made sure to take a couple with different exposures because I knew that at some point I would end up, you know, turning this into either a watercolor or an acrylic painting. And what role does light play in your paintings? I love paintings um, and pieces of art that have very strong dynamic lighting. And I think part of it is just the challenge of trying to capture all the different values. Um, and that can be really difficult, especially when you're working with photographs because the photos often don't pick up on all of the really fine details um, and the differentiations of light. Um, I think that it is uh, kind of symbolic of um, just the, really the ephemeral nature of these everyday moments, because this particular moment and these particular shadows only lasted for a couple minutes, and then everything is constantly changing and evolving. And so I think that is just, it's a nice symbolic reminder of just how fleeting every moment is. That's very true. Uh, our next painting, I'm excited about this one. This is a work in progress, which I love. This is a, a very rare opportunity to see uh, so a, a painting at this stage. And um, uh, could you tell us about your process and what are your next steps? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, uh, you can see a little bit of glare on the left-hand side of the painting. It's just, this is an iPhone photo and it's very much a work in progress. Um, since I painted Mary's office, I started to work more in oils, and this is really the first large scale oil painting that I've done. So I'm still working through a lot of, you know, kind of details and getting the, uh, getting both the composition right, but also um, there's a big difference in how the colors shift between acrylic and oil. And with acrylic, the colors get a little bit darker as they dry. So I was constantly, I, I spent years painting in acrylics and I was constantly making that mental calculation of what color is it on my palette versus what color is it going to be once it's on the canvas and dry. And with oil, I don't have to do that, but sometimes I keep going back to that, that way of thinking. And so 
it's a fun challenge and I definitely still have a lot to learn um, as far as just the overall medium. How do you choose which objects to feature? This was a photo that I took uh, many years ago and the objects here I featured, um, first I was just, I believe I, I may have received these tulips from a friend and I really just wanted to capture some nice photos of them. And um, one of my favorite moments of pretty much every morning is just pouring that first cup of coffee. And when it's in a mason jar, you can see kind of like the light coming through the milk and it just makes it, you know, everything so beautiful. And then with the light shining through, um, again, that directional lighting created a lot of interesting kind of shadows and color casts. Um, plus they're just uh, a group of all my favorite things. So books, flowers, coffee, cookies. Um, the cookies have a way to go, but um, yeah. So just capturing all of that in one painting is just a joy to work with this subject matter. I also begin my day with a giant <laughs> mug of coffee. And uh, do the objects have a deeper meaning? Not in this particular sense. I definitely, um, <laughs> uh, it in a, to me personally, it, it just speaks to life before children because that bookcase that you see in the back was uh, originally filled with books and now it is filled with board games and Legos and the books are in a bin in my basement and uh, just waiting for, I guess, the empty nest years when I can go put them back in and, uh, and see them every day. Um, but no, this, this was really just, uh, just about the things that give me pleasure and the things that I love looking at every day. Yes, I remember. I remember books. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Our next, I think we, you may have just foreshadowed our next, uh, our next work. Yes. Um, this is, is a portrait, which is a very unique type of interior. And uh, who is the subject? This is my oldest son, Liam. And he was about four or maybe five at the time of this painting. He's eight now. And uh, I wanted to ask about the title, Portrait of an, Art of an Artist as a Young Man. Is he the third generation artist in your family? He might be. So he, uh, he is definitely very talented and very creative in, in drawing, um, but he also wants to uh, work at, at Mojang and be a Minecraft developer when he oh, grows okay. up. So it changes every day. I, I think he'll always retain that creativity though, that really wonderful imagination. That's great. And are your the approaches between portraits and interiors different for you? Absolutely. The office painting I did was, I think, probably the first interior, the first kind of still life subject that I ever really tackled. Up until then, it's always just been portraits, which I love both because, you know, I'm often painting members of my family and my friends. And so it's just kind of a nice meditation as you're working through um, on the relationships that you have with people and what you love about them. And I also really enjoy the challenge of trying to capture a likeness. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't have that challenge as much with interiors, but once you added all of the dynamic lighting of that particular subject and you know the things on the walls, um, it became a really unique challenge in and of itself just to create that sense of realism. Um, whereas with portraits, it was more capturing a moment, creating a sense of emotion and, you know, that likeness as well. Uh, when I look at this, I, I automatically um, go back through my mental file of uh, very well-known interior paintings throughout art history, and many of them feature you know, windows and lighting and uh, writing comes in a lot. And I think that is partly because, you know, before electricity, people sat near windows when they wrote because they needed the light. Um, but I love the the window pattern. It's, it's on the back of the wall there. I think that um, certainly uh, is something that makes you think. And uh, what about this particular moment caught your attention? 
This was when my son was sitting at a desk in front of a window. He was just staring at the window and thinking about what he wanted to draw next. And so, of course, the light coming in the window, creating all of those really dramatic shadows was the first thing that I enjoyed about it. I really loved how the light in particular warmed up his features. Um, you can tell there's a lot of translucence like in his ear and in some of his fingers. And it was just, it added a lot of depth to the subject matter. But I also love the uh, kind of the faraway look in his eye. Um, because the window was come, the light was coming in through the window, which is would be on the left. Um, I actually added that bit of light afterwards um, because you know I needed something to kind of highlight the crayon in his hand. Um, without it, it seemed just a little bit flat, and I wanted to give it that extra spark in the background. So that was layered in afterwards, and I, I loved how it kind of also gave the sense of a passage of time um, with the angle of it. You can kind of envision, you know, it going across the wall um, mm -hmm. over the course of this, you know, this drawing period. So wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, I you. see we have some questions here for you, so we're going to bring you back in for our question and answer portion. Sounds great. And our next artist, uh, Lauren Wordy, is an artist, educator, and curator living and working in Philadelphia. And welcome, Lauren. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you. And uh, if I didn't already say, we're going to be putting the uh, artists' bios and websites in the chat box uh, if you'd like to, to learn more. And uh, this is uh, Dining Table, which is currently featured in Art of the State. Mm -hmm. And could you start out by telling us a little bit about your journey as an artist? Sure. Um, I guess practically you'll see some of the education stuff in my bio, but um, artistically, I feel like I've always just wondered what could belong in painting. And I think that extends to the imagery that's allowed to be present in a painting, whether that's kitschy or whether it looks like art or not, and how that may be also reflective of, of who gets to be an artist or who gets to be perceived within um, the, the canon of art history. Would you mind telling us a little bit about what we're looking at in Dining Table? Sure. Um, this is a space in my house. So it is the painting comes from memory. I don't use photos to assemble things. Sometimes I'll make drawings at home and then take them to the studio. Um, I think that that gives me more freedom with the paint. And uh, I've got sushi, I've got my, my notebook, I've got, there's a spoon on the table, receipts, different kinds of books, a lint roller, um, the the um, image on the right is a portrait of my mom. And so it's just, it's this setup of, of items that are, I don't know, maybe slamming all of the things together from work and life and just putting them in the same place. And I think a lot of the times they are um, that juggling or that the way that we hold things in our mind is, is invisible. And I've just been trying to make that maybe more tangible or, or give an image to it. Were these objects already on their table or did you arrange them specifically? And if so, what do they represent? Huh, I think the, the stuff in my painting becomes assembled as more of a collage. So the table never actually probably looked quite like this. So um, you know, I, I have food in a lot of my paintings. I think they allow for a certain kind of squishiness of paint where it can be delicious looking or disgusting like there's something oddly fleshy about those pinks um and and through this weird green light of everything else too um the books are amy silman's faux pas which came out during the pandemic which is just a really great book of of her uh writings how to do nothing is above that i thought that was an amazing book of i guess just pre-pandemic and talking about I don't know how, how we resist <laughs> in many ways um, in regards to identity or, or gender or just ex expectations. Um, the mug on top is by um, someone named Kurt Anderson. I love how cartoony they are and um, 
Yeah, I think they've all got odd personal and sentimental uh, elements to them, but I think also familiar in some way or not quite universal, but shared. Why do you choose the perspective that you choose? I think this one comes from a lot of uh, looking at a lot of still life and maybe mostly in the vein of Juan Gris, uh, Picasso, Brock, um, and Bernard and thinking about, and Cezanne, and thinking about what a, a lived perspective is. So maybe you're looking down sometimes and out other times. So things are, since it's assembled as a collage, things are coming from different perspectives or, um, you know, almost has this like fisheye sense to it. And this one is uh, <clears throat> very timely. And uh, could you tell us about this painting and the scene that we are looking at? Sure, it's the same table as the previous painting, but in a different perspective. So maybe like a little bit more as though, I don't know, maybe more so from a standing perspective. Um, and, you know, as COVID Thanksgiving was a really weird time, you can see the Zoom uh, laptop in the top left corner. And, um, you know, the, it, it's a small table that is just overly filled with all of these foods. They're, they're sentimental to many of us for different reasons. They sort of remind us of like Thanksgiving's past. And um, I think this was my second Thanksgiving without my parents. And I thought maybe everybody's in the same boat that year in terms of not being able to be with people. And so there's, I don't know, there, there's a reason why we, we replicate these, um, these feasts every year. There's a familiarity about them that I think has to do with sharing experiences, but also loss and time passing. So I think it's just a very um, human time of the year. And, and last year was just such a bizarre one. Yeah, so it was uh, definitely certainly bizarre. And I think you just as, answered my question about uh, why this particular meal. Mm -hmm. So I'll move on to um, my next one, which is in what ways does this represent a specific scene and in, in what ways does it represent an experience? Mm, I think I think the imagery starts to represent the scene because it the turkey and the like the stuff, the image represents the the familiarity that we have with turkey and mashed potatoes and just the way that those things assemble in our minds. Um, and I think that the experience, maybe for me mostly comes from color use and paint handling. So how fast I replicate this imagery, how slow, how resolved, how um, open-ended or still just like paint strokes things look like. Um, and I think those elements point the image more toward feeling. And so I, I think maybe that goes toward the sense of experience more so. This is very interesting. And uh, what is the story behind Desk View? Also sort of a, a COVID narrative of, um, you know, my, I am an adjunct teacher. I work at multiple institutions. And during that time, uh, school went online. It's very hard to teach students uh, something that is meant to be in person from a computer screen. Um, and so my studio became my office, which also was the place where I'd eat lunch, which is, you know, it just is everything all in one. So I, I tried to really put all of that in there. Um, and I also was thinking about how in Zoom, you know, you can see what is directly behind me. We all have a Zoom setup or a background, but you can't see what's like all around, what is beyond that camera view or what is out of that perspective. And so I thought, the mess of that was, was an interesting contrast to the neat studio that my students could see during that presentation time. It definitely, uh, to me, it, it looks like a busy day. <laughs> and is that is that kind of what inspired you to, to capture that particular scene was just the, the feeling of your studio being your office and your, your Zoom table and yeah, and I think a lot of that has to do with, I mean, similarly to the dining table painting, the all of the stuff that we, especially women juggle like domestic space, workspace, and all of a sudden it's all really slammed together in a way that maybe that forces us to look at it in a different way. Um, in terms of art history, the, the genre of still life frequently either represents the 
the sort of calm order of the domestic space or the when it's messy it's frequently like a like the mad genius male space and so I think that contrast is interesting historically and and I wanted to kind of put it all together and you know from my own perspective and you know maybe it's all <laughs> it's all messy and chaotic and domestic and <laughs> partially orderly like in in little bits so trying to put that all together and to me, this also seems like a portrait of life as an artist educator, because it includes so many stages of the creative process. Was that part of your intent? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's sort of the, the idea that almost any painting can be a self-portrait. And so trying to take the format of the still life and, and make it personal is something that I'm very interested in. And I think the the your laptop has a painting on it that is is also yours. Is that mm -hmm. am I recognizing that? Okay. Yes, exactly. Like, There's like screens on screens. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting to think about making art digital too, uh, especially for for a digital program. Yes, definitely. Thank you for noticing that. <laughs> sure, sure. Got my own. And I think we are actually at a great place to uh, begin our question and answer uh, portion. So I'm going to um, unshare my screen quickly. And Kelly, there's Kelly. Okay, excellent. And um, the first question we have is for Lauren. And uh, does humor come up at all for you in painting or whether in collaging these images? Yes, absolutely. I, I love it when paintings have a sense of humor. They're, I don't know, I always try and embed silly art jokes and, and maybe that's direct references to um, art history paintings or maybe that's just sort of the humor of like, I don't know how weird that sushi looks like. Is it appetizing? It's got a lot of that mayo on it. Um, so I, I think those visceral qualities are just so human and it, I don't know, I think paintings should be as complicated and varied as people, so we're all funny sometimes. <laughs> it's, it's very true. And a question for Kelly here. Uh, do you schedule your painting sessions during certain times of the day to capture certain light features? Um, unfortunately, I do not. I would love to one day be in a position where I, I can do that, but I'm, uh, I'm usually working at night when my kids are asleep. And uh, I'm often working from photographs, so it um, it's not ideal, but it's definitely a good challenge to look at the photograph and analyze how would this appear differently in real life. And a lot of times I'm looking for cues and clues in my day to day, um, you know, about really how the light does affect things that the camera might not pick up on. And a question here for both of you. Uh, are you inspired by any particular artist? I'm a huge art history nerd. There's so much that I love. And I think, um, you know, it would be so hard to pick just one. I think Matisse was always my first art love, but you know, it, it's so exciting to feel like the, the power to be in conversation with any artist that you're excited about. And, you know, that changes all the time. I love Juan Gris. There's a great show at the Baltimore Museum right now of his work. My inspirations are tend to be really eclectic. So um, Matisse is one of my favorites too. I particularly love his collages, um, collage. Um, I, I love Walter White. We went to a um, an exhibition where he had built sculptures out of cardboard and I also grew up seeing some of his set designs on you know on TV um, so there's there's a lot of different artists Mary White for watercolor um, yeah I, I it's hard to pick just one or even a handful and how did you both develop your particular painting styles I mean, I think they're still developing and I, I think it has a lot to do with the the painters that I love. Like I love the materiality of paint. I love the idea that a painting is something that changes with your your distance to it. So the way that I, I think about brushstroke or image making has to do with um, maybe my experience of paintings like Monet where you see the image from far away and you walk up close and it's almost gone. 
Um, and so those, just those phenomenological things that excite me are, are what drives me to paint in a certain way. Yeah, I would say mine is still very much evolving too. Uh, right now, I think it's just symptomatic of how much of a perfectionist I am. I am really interested in capturing um, a photorealistic style. So you don't really see any brush strokes in my painting. And once I would love to get to a point um, in my progress where, where I'm more comfortable uh, incorporating the brush strokes and, and some more abstraction. Um, but uh, right now it's it's all about the the little details. Great. And Lauren, how do you paint such large canvases from a hovering perspective? Do you use mirrors? Ah, no, I don't use mirrors. It's more um, of that kind of assemblage idea of of I don't know, sometimes it comes from like how the plane begins on the canvas. Like how do I fit that circle of the table on? whatever kind of rectangle. And so that comes from observation, but there's also like a, a purposeful warping of that to, to force it into the, the painting space. Uh, Kelly, do you prefer painting over the other media that you work, that you work with? There are really two different frames of mind. So I find myself, for some reason, it's, it's almost seasonal for me. I find myself doing a lot of painting um, well, at nighttime, uh, a lot of times, you know, when the weather is colder, I'll, um, I'll work primarily on canvas and panel with acrylics and oils. Um, and then at other times when I need to just kind of decompress and, and not think too, you know, not think too particularly deeply about what I'm working on, then I'll do really abstract collages. I keep an art journal and I'm always just pasting random bits of pieces in there. And so uh, it really just depends on what mind frame I'm in at the moment and what materials lend themselves best to that expression. Thank you. And uh, Lauren, we have a question here about your colors. Um, do you enhance them and, and how do you choose how or what colors I guess to pick for for the, your paintings? Um, yeah, so my table is not green. It's definitely more of a wood, but I mean, even in the one that is brown, there's orange and pink in it. So I think um, a lot of the color comes from observation or um, adjustments based on observation. So I think it's so much easier when the subject is at home and then I'm in the studio to have the freedom to, to shift things. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with with mood or feeling. Color can do so much in terms of expression. Thank you. And it looks like our last two questions are for both of you. Um, how do you choose your canvases or your panel sizes? I work, I like working with the systems of sizes. So I, I have consistent sizes as I go. I like things that aren't maybe quite related to um, our familiar idea of a rectangle, like what a TV screen proportion might be, or the idea of 18 by 24, or things like that. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of skew my shapes a little bit more toward the square, but not quite. I think there's a, a nice tension in that, or maybe, a, maybe it just feels more unique as a size because it's unfamiliar. My choices right now revolve mostly around practicality. Um, it's just a lot easier and quicker to set up if I'm working on a slightly smaller surface. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the day when I have both the space and the confidence to tackle something in a much larger format because I always find them so striking in person when you're experiencing this image that's you know, as big or larger than you are. I, it's just not, um, it's not something I'm ready to tackle quite yet. <laughs> We will stay tuned to <laughs> see future developments. And the last question is, what projects will you be working on next? Um, I've been working with layering a lot of patterns. So um, setting still lifes up that are maybe a, a floral pattern with actual flowers and vase on top. And so um, now that I'm able to spend more time in the studio versus <laughs> the home office studio situation. Um, 
it's nice to make those setups in in my space and and work from that. Mine, I think I'm just going to try to continue to master the oil medium, not that you can ever really master any medium, but um, get more familiar with with oil paints and uh, in time, hopefully loosen up a little bit and find really that happy medium of photorealism, but also something that's a little bit looser and more expressionistic. We do have a, a technical question here. What what are the differences or how do you find the acrylic and, and oil to be different to work with? There's a lot. And I was actually surprised at how many there were when I first started with oil. And um, the drying time is vastly different. And you can you can change that up with both mediums or with both, yeah, but both types of paints based on which mediums you use. But then those mediums also bring in other characteristics that you may or may not want in your painting. And with acrylics, they dried so fast that uh, it really actually suited my perfectionistic tendencies because I could put something down, wait 30 seconds, put something else down. And when I do that with oil, I get mud right away. And then I just end up getting so frustrated with it. I have to step away and let it dry for about 30 days because there's so much paint on the canvas. So there's a there's a lot of nuances that I'm working through. But I, I find that with the fundamentals, the, uh, you know, understanding really, you know, the color theory and composition, um, you, I don't have to worry so much about those. I can really just focus on the technicalities of the mediums. Lauren, do you have a, do you have any experience with uh, acrylic as well as oil? Yeah, absolutely. Um, last summer I got to go to Golden Artist Colors. They have an artist residency where they make both uh, Williamsburg oil paints and their whole line of, of acrylics. And so you, you get to work with their experts. Um, I think acrylic can do so many things in terms of texture. You can make it look like it has sand in it or like you can really manipulate textures in different ways and, and work in layering because of the drying time. Um, I mean, I'm fascinated, Kelly, that you have gotten acrylic to look so well blended. That is really, really hard. <laughs> um, and like that blending is something that I usually think of as being easier in oil because that's just, you know, what I'm used to working with and it stays wet so it can mush together, which can be a challenge or a benefit depending on on how you like to work or or you know how <laughs> what color feels like doing i joke with my family that a lot of my paintings look like top topographical maps because when you hold them sideways you'll see the like hundreds of layers that i put on there trying to get really that perfect blend but it is a huge challenge and that's one of the things that's really refreshing about oil in particular is it's it's a lot easier <laughs> yeah, you can make it smooth pretty easy. I mean, that reminds me of the Norman Rockwell paintings. If you've ever been to that museum, when you actually see them in person, they're so physical. They're really thick because I think they might be oil, but, but they're like made for the photographs. So there's this strange difference that happens. And uh, you both uh, brought up a really good point about uh, seeing paintings in person. And I would certainly encourage our audience to visit Art of the State. It will be open until January 2nd. And you can see Kelly and Lauren's paintings in person. And you can get up close and look at the details and look at the different painterly styles and uh, really experience them, experience them in person. And I wanted to say thank you to Lauren and Kelly for joining us today. And we will be releasing uh, this video if you want to uh, rewatch or if you want to share with someone who wasn't able to join us, we will be uh, resending it out. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I'm going to uh, reshare my screen and talk about a few more programs that we have uh, coming up. Okay, on Sunday, we will have a, an in-person gallery tour of Art of the State that will be with uh, the museum director, Beth Hager, and featured artist, artist Harold Zavedi. And that will begin at two o'clock in the Art of the State Gallery. And we still have a lot of program coming up for artists of all ages. 
On Wednesday, December 8th, we have a children's program. Uh, it's an explore program that will reference art from Art of the State. And the very last day of the exhibition is Sunday, January 2nd. And I will be uh, leading a tour with the featured artist, Stephen Althaus. And that will be your last chance to see the exhibition in person. And uh, on the Art of the State's YouTube page, we have a number of other artist conversations programs that were recorded and they are available for viewing. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today.